Okay, what I want to talk about is a way of working or a system of working we call Taylor, Soma Veda Taylor, T A E L R, Tool Assisted Energy Line Release. And it's a concept, it's a protocol, it has protocols, but basically it's based on the traditional use and the modern use of tools in traditional Thai medicine and traditional Thai yoga therapy. Most people have never actually been in a traditional, a Thai traditional medicine clinic or a traditional medicine treatment facility. Most people, their experience with Thai massage, or what they call Thai massage, traditional Thai yoga, has been at more entry level uh, from people who have trained at more entry level and or in tourist massage type of situations where the emphasis is on relaxation versus medicine, versus curing disease, curing disease conditions. In traditional medicine situations that emphasize curing, that emphasize treating diseases, um, practitioners commonly use tools. They use many of them. And the different schemes of tools that are used, um, some of which are identifiable as coming from Ayurveda traditions, like you'd see descriptions of them written about in the Sashruta Samhita, oldest books in Ayurveda, some of which you might think are associated more closely with traditional Chinese medicine because they're used for scraping and that kind of thing, and they might be called Gua Sha. The traditional Thai tools that seem very more uniquely Thai, although they are also referenced in Indian, traditional Indian medicine in Ayurveda are called Toksen. Uh, and then there are the crossovers and variations of all the above that, that may come directly from Thai culture, Indian culture, uh, Cambodian, Laotian culture, Burmese culture, and even Tibetan culture by way of the hill tribes, people who have migrated into Thailand over centuries into northern uh, Thailand. Uh, but basically they have to do with bringing energy, attention, consciousness, breath, and pressure to energy lines and points. Now, since the energy lines and points happen to be located on the physical body, then it looks like we're also bringing energy, attention, consciousness, breath, and pressure to points and lines on the physical body, which may have other names. You know, so uh, on my arm, I may call this shoulder, elbow, and arm, with uh, bicep area and forearm area and hand, okay? Energetically, I might say it's lung, large intestine, heart, and pericardium, okay? Or I may refer to it with some other aspect of uh, marma, as in using te uh, te technology of points from marma sakitsa and Ayurveda, okay? Uh, the primary emphasis is not on the physical body, the primary emphasis is on the energy lines, hence the tool-assisted energy line release, okay? So, uh, tool-assisted energy line release, okay? T hence the tailor, pronounced like, like a sewing, like a tailor. Uh, that's the way you would pronounce it. But the fundamentals uh, come, let's say, I'll pick one because it seems to be the most uh, interesting to me right this minute, is the gua sha. And we know that this is a jade gua sha tool, okay? And some people would say, oh, it's, it's Chinese, okay? However, uh, you also notice there's a little hole in it. The little hole in it is so you can tie a string to it and maybe hang a tassel from it, which I don't know, maybe it makes it easier to find, but also because uh, it has a subtle heart shape and is also worn as a protective amulet. Okay, and what's kind of interesting is that as a therapist, I could wear it as an amulet, and then when I need it as a decorative piece, but it has protective qualities of jade around my heart. Uh, but then if I uh, am working and I need to do some therapy that requires this kind of a tool, I just whip it off and I've got my tool right there. And then I can just put it back on and I never lose it. I don't have to worry about, oh, where's, where is my little uh, gua sha tool? Okay, you also notice this heart shape is not exactly uh, random, okay? That 
the different concavities fit different parts of the body. But the idea of the different shapes and the, the protrusions and the concavities, whether convex or concave, okay, actually allow it to conform to different areas of the body with a different type of technique that you might want to use. Whether it's a larger area, like, like even like a finger, like I'm working for to help treat somebody for a, a disorder called a trigger finger, okay? Or something of that nature. Or I'm using it on the foot to treat, um, oh, uh, plantar fasciitis or something like that, okay? But, Again, the primary function of the tool is to scrape and to bring energy. See, I say scrape, okay? But scraping is, um, is just a descriptor, okay? Because it's what I would call the technique of using the tool to uh, bring energy, attention, consciousness, breath, and pressure to the energy line. This idea of scraping is incidental to that, okay? And this focuses my energy. So think of this as the same function energetically, uh, uh, all of these is fact, as a magnifying glass that when we put it in the sunlight and get a focal length that's just right, we can take a big broad uh, source of energy like the sun and we can focus it down to a pinpoint where it can actually start a fire or boil water or where I could actually sterilize a medical instrument or a needle with a magnifying glass if I didn't have anything else. If I had some sun, access to some sun and I could just focus, I could actually sterilize a needle or sterilize a medical instrument using a magnifying glass. Why? Because it focuses the energy of the sun. So the, we know that, for example, Jade, um, uh, absorbs infrared at a higher rate than other stones. So one of the higher, one of the energy healing qualities of jade, for instance, why I would even use something made out of jade, is because it already has this property of collecting and focusing energy. Okay, it happens to be more in the light spectrum and thermal spectrum, invisible light spectrum. Okay, but. In general, it takes my chi and allows me to focus it. All of these tools are about doing that. Now, but what's the origin of gua sha? Right here. In Tai Wei, this is the origin of gua sha. So I Y to my Dio. The name of this is Dio. Okay? I Y to my Dio to pay respect. Okay? Uh, this is from my school. Uh, was given to me when I graduated as a teacher from Putai Suwan as a Kuru and Kabi Kabang, Samnak Ayutthaya as a teacher in the traditional martial arts of Thailand, Kabi Kabang, Fanda, Dap Sang Mu Dio, Nuat Boran, Nuat Muay Thai, Boran Muay Thai, etc., etc. And it's a real sword, okay? So the ancient history of Gua Sha starts with a real sword, all right? And this sword is considered to be um, alive, is considered to have its own essence, a spirit that's unique to this sword, and it is infused with magic in a spiritual ceremony when it's made by its maker. And the maker puts various hash marks and various waveforms from from mandalas of, uh, uh, that express uh, infinite energy and so on that are actually imprinted into the blade when the blade is uh, forged, okay? And so you say, well, how is this the origin of, of uh, Gua Sha? Well, first of all, in uh, practicing and using swords, um, we use the flat of the sword, we use the back of the sword, and we use the handle of the sword, we use the hilt of the sword, and we use the pommel of the sword, which is shaped very specifically, okay? The pommel of the sword. And so in practicing the sword as a spiritual art, much less as a combative art, you get beat up quite a bit. Okay, you get beat up quite a bit, all right? And we were taught 
that the sword creates an injury, but the sword also is the vehicle for healing, both for internal injury, what we would call mental, emotional, or spiritual injury inside the person, that this sword could help us to heal internally. But we were also taught to use this literally, physically, to uh, heal from wounds that we would get in the martial art training of Gabi Kabong. Okay, and so for example, one of the techniques, one of the things is, is, is if I handed you the sword, because it's a real sword, it's, it is actually heavy, okay? This sword is not light, okay? Uh, it probably weighs about four pounds, okay? Something like that, it's approximately 28 inches long on the blade and it's half an inch wide at the base. It tapers to a needle point, which is sharp enough, you can dig a splinter out of your finger with the end of the sword, okay? You could chop a tree down with it, uh, or dig a splinter out of your hand. Of course, that's not really what it was designed for. It was designed to remove your parts one from another. That's what it was designed for, right? But in practice, uh, we use it as a spiritual development tool, okay? So let's say as I'm using it, and we would use two of these. I, I should have brought my other one. They come in pairs. There's a male and female of these swords because it's one sword to each hand okay and what happens is I get a lot of strain and a lot of stress in my elbow and in my shoulder from extending and from using the sword okay and so I get this bruising so what is the antidote to that is after I finish my practice but while I'm still wet while I'm still sweaty Okay, I take the sword and I just down the energy line with the sword. Okay, so my arms get sore and swollen, right? We call that hypotrophy in physical education, sports medicine, okay? Uh, because now there's too much energy around the joint. Okay, I've accumulated too much energy around the joint. And if you were to, after a practice, if you were to squeeze my elbows and my forearms or my shoulders, you'd find that they were hard, that they were inflamed, and they were hot. Okay, hot, hard, and inflamed. Okay, and in your elbow, that's not a good thing, right? So what we would do is, we'd take the sword, and not hard, not enough to create an injury. Now see, the back is not sharp. Okay. This is razor sharp. This is not. Okay, so now I take it and what I do is I would stroke the sin line or the meridian that is hottest, that is most sensitive. Okay, and I would work the energy out. Okay, and then I work above and below the area that's obstructed. Okay, and I would do this for my whole arm. Okay, all right. Now that starts with the Dio. It's the name of the sword. <clears throat> but even very much older tradition. This is about a 500-year-old uh, Nepalese kukri, and also made in the same fashion, also made in the same fashion as the Dio, okay, because this is the oldest form of a sword. Uh, we actually think that the origin of this shape, of this blade, okay, starts with the uh, Alexander the Great, that this is the type of weapon that Alexander the Great's army brought to the Himalayas and to Northern India, so it's actually Greek in origin, but then was adopted by the Hindu people that Alexander uh, encountered in his march across Tibet and into northern India and eventually to conquer Egypt. And uh, this is the preferred shape. And you see the shape of this blade from ancient Greek to the Himalayas to India, uh, followed the Mekong south through Burma into northern Thailand. And then you also see it in carvings in stone 
on the walls of Egyptian pyramids, like in the Temple of Karnak and so on. So it's been around forever. It's considered to be a living thing, okay? We wide to the Kukri also. Um, has a little notch here. Uh, this notch is uh, for non-warfare type of use of the knife. Uh, if I was a devout Hindu, I would prick my finger uh, every time I pull the knife out of the sheath to produce a drop of blood so that it would appease the spirit of the Kukri, which is actually uh, Kali's preferred weapon. And Kali's the destroyer, and this is what Kali uses to destroy. Okay? However, it is also a tool for healing. All right? Uh, the back of the blade, you see, is very wide and tapered. Um, this one has a, a less dramatic hook shape uh, sweep than modern ones. The older ones are, more, are a little straight like this. They don't have a really dramatic curve like some modern ones do. Uh, but if you can see very closely, you'll see there are grooves and also there are banded striations through this which show that it was hand forged in the Damascus layering style of, of manufacture, which means when this was originally made, it probably took the smith one or two years to make. This was their job for a year or more, okay, was to make this and a, a high level of technique and high level of effort to do this. However, not just for warfare, okay, uh, because we can use the back of the blade again. See, we have this tool. We have this beautiful tool, which can be used for scraping or bringing energy to the energy lines. This is classic Asian concept, which is called yin and yang, yin and on. This side, yang, death and destruction, cleaving apart, even if it's just a coconut. <laughs> cleaving the coconut, okay? I don't have to use it for warfare, I can use it for dinner. I can use this, it cuts bamboo really, really well. I can use this to make a house, to make a whole house, or to make furniture, you know, but it's very yang, okay? However, the moon on the back side, is the is the goddess energy okay the protrusion on the front side this is the male lingam this is the female in the crescent moon and so the back of the blade can be used uh, for healing okay so used for scraping and used for for light impact okay for tapping for what we call toksen and even some people will take uh, you can use the blade, you don't have to hit it very hard, but you can use it as, as a hammer, okay? And it's made for that. It's, it's meant to be used that way, okay? You see this one is so old. The wood is carved with sacred lingam and sacred geometries, even in every part of the scabbard. Okay, so this, and this, this is in my opinion the origin of the Gua Sha. Another source of the Gua Sha is broken pottery. In other words, uh, in the old days, just because something broke was no excuse to throw it away. So if you had a pot that had a shard that was big enough that you could get a hold of it, and you could file the edges off of it, you could take that piece of pottery, and let's say you weren't a rich person, because see, only a rich person would own a sword like this, because this might cost you a year's wages, okay, or two, depending. Uh, only a rich person could have a kukri like this, or a person whose family passed it down in a traditional way, could afford to have a knife like this, only, only a rich person. Uh, but even a poor person who couldn't afford jade because jade in the past was very valuable and in fact there are periods of time in Chinese history where it was illegal for common people to own it or it was illegal for common people to own it so it would not have been widely used for therapy by common people but 
what they might have done is taken a piece of broken pottery and shaped it in such a way that it would work exactly the same as the jade. And guess what? It's okay if it's not jade. It's not so much about the material. Even though materials have intrinsic healing properties, and we use materials because of their intrinsic healing properties, but if something doesn't have the right intrinsic healing property as a tool, but you need to do healing work, you get the nearest, closest approximate approximation to the tool, and what do you do? You bless it, you purify it, you cleanse it, you wash it, and then you what? You declare it to be the tool that you need with intention. Intention is what makes these tools therapeutic. An ordinary life, bamboo, artfully carved into a spatula and spoon, we call them salad tongs, okay? But really, are they really salad tongs? Is that the highest, best use? for these appliances? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna give you an answer to that. I, I don't know, I like salads. <laughs> so, <laughs> I get all happy, you know, when I hear the clack of these things on the, on the uh, uh, coconut, on the uh, monkey wood bowl, you know? But here's the thing, the shape is perfect for scraping. Okay, you just choke up on the handle a little bit, and even using the comb, is also dispersing and a great way to release the energy. So technically speaking, this is an ideal tool for releasing and balancing energy in chi. Ideal. For the whole body, you can use it. And you've got all the tapping ideas that you can do. Or a little... Say with the spatula. Okay, and even the super high tech modern steel versions of these I could do with a nine with a with a 50 cent maybe 25 cent bamboo spatula from the dollar store okay so just because you don't maybe don't have access to traditional tools as long as you understand what they are and how they work you have access because you have access to tools okay so uh, traditional Thai reflexology, this is very common. People see this. It's very common. It's really, it's just a little wooden pencil. A little wider on one end, a little narrower on the other. Of course, the narrow end for some point work, it gets in between the toes really nicely. And you can work the broader areas with the rounder parts. So you're doing more planar or more working the lines. You can also roll it like so as a mini roller, which also means that it's good for using on the face, okay? It's good for working on the face or on the chin, and you can use it this way. You can heat it up. You can make this out of any kind of wood, okay? Any kind of wood. However, you can also take your wooden hammer and you can, you can talk the points. Okay. Uh, this one you gotta really hang on to. Alright, and then this is a traditional tie tool. Looks like a device of torture, which it is. <laughs> one. Any way you want. You want more? Okay. It's a hundred ways to use this tool. 
Yeah, it's many tools in one. It's a little, little multi-tool, multi-talk, okay? You can also you can also use it in the talk sin style of hammering. This is a singing bowl. Well, singing bowl is is a tool, right? Because I can make it sing. And I can use the sound for therapy. But if I rest it on the body, I can generate the pressure waves and the tone which will send vibrations and frequencies into the body, which will have the kind of healing effects that I want to have with that. The bowl is a tool. Even the base of the bowl is a tool. Example, or on the hips. Oh, Dr. J, now you're just getting all ridiculous. Ridiculous. Because if you're paying attention to me, I'm almost giving the impression that you could use just about anything to do therapy with. That's the old story with Chewbacca, why Chewbacca became the thrice crowned king of physicians. He was asked the question, go out to the world and find me one thing that you cannot do medicine with. And he's the only person who failed the exercise in his class. And because he failed, he graduated and became the head of the class because he failed, because he couldn't find, he says, oh, teacher, forgive me. Teacher, forgive me. Because I'm the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low, the slowest of the slow because I have failed you utterly and completely after all these years of study, and I could not go out and I could not find one thing that I could not use for medicine or therapy. And of course, his teacher, who allegedly was Atria, that was his name, goes, ta-da, everybody pay attention. Your classmate just graduated. Has <laughs> just graduated. Right. So Atria, can't find one thing that he cannot do therapy with, and so he fails the exercise and wins the award as the king of medicine, okay? So when we're thinking about traditional Thai, we have a thousand year tradition, actually a multi-thousand year tradition over time. What has not been used in the practice of medicine? We don't know. Every day we discover something new. Spoons of different kinds, you know, maybe a smaller spoon, a smaller gua sha spoon is suitable. So we call this a Chinese soup spoon, okay? However, it just so happens to be the perfect size and the perfect shape to do a variety from tight on the line, acupressure style, concave scraping, convex, scooping, spreading. In other words, how many ways can I use this simple soup spoon to move the energy, to keep the energy from stagnating? Also traditional tools uh, used for nature, uh, bamboo. Okay, I made these. It's just a section of bamboo and it is used for rolling, like a rolling pin to move the energy. It's um, also used percussively. And that's why we have them in pairs. And so we can use them percussively and that works really, really well. And if you get on the back, if you want to get all swoopy, you can <laughs> use two at a time. And you can roll two at a time. It works, it comes across really nice with some lubrication. I hope we get to do some of that. All right, as far as uh, back to this, here's a modern version of this. It's a modern version of this. Why? With the metal ends, uh, they are easy to be cleaned. That's, that's one thing, okay? But the nice thing about this is, and I haven't actually done that with this um, reflexology tool. <laughs> <laughs> but in this sleeve is a piece of paper. Let's see if I can coach it out. 
I haven't done one of these in a while, so it might be kind of stiff. And the reason this piece of paper is in here is A, you can put any color. So if you want a color enhanced effect in your reflexology tool, that's why you can change the color. The other reason is you can take a pen or a pencil and you can write a healing mantra or healing words or draw healing symbols on the paper to sort of, again, what we're doing is we're reinforcing our intention, okay? And then you take that and you put it back in the sleeve and you put it back together. And I can tell you that the gentleman who made this, that, that was his intention right from the beginning, was that you would be able to take it, your tool that you're gonna use for your reflexology and be able to tune it to both your personal essence, if you will, but also maybe even on a client basis that you could actually say, I'm gonna do reflexology on you, but I'm gonna make a reflexology tool for you, for your use, for your application. And maybe each client would have their own tool. You ever go to a Japanese restaurant and a really traditional Japanese restaurant, you go in and you see all these little boxes on shelves. They look like boxes, actually they're cups. And what it's for is when you go and you order sake, they serve the sake to you in your own cup. It has your name on it. Nobody else uses it. So you don't have to carry your cup to the sake place. You, if you're a regular customer, you have your own cup on the wall. And so when you go in and order sake, they bring you your cup, okay? And some, if you, the bottles of sake can be really big, well then they'll actually store your bottle. So it's sort of BYOB, okay? But the idea of why do people do it is because it's personal. It's my cup. How cool is that? If I went to some place for a cup of coffee and they bring my coffee in my cup, my favorite cup, okay? So how cool is it if you could offer your, your, uh, your customers a tool that you made personal for them, it's their tool. And the only time it gets used is when they come for that therapy. Anyway, it's, it's an idea that comes to pass as we start thinking about this. The scraping becomes cupping. Scraping becomes cupping. There are basically two systems for cupping. This is one that's very common. So we have different size, we have different size cups. Okay, this is a set, right? So we have different size cups. I might use one of these, I might use all of them. It just depends on what I'm doing. Is it a broad area? Am I gonna work a whole line? Again, what's the point of the cup? The cup is to bring the energy more directly to that place, right? So uh, these are interesting. They have a little valve in them. They're kind of high tech. In the old days, they'd be made out of glass and you got to start a fire and you put the fire in the cup and then you quickly put it on the skin and the, the fire, create, uh, which burns up the air, creates a vacuum and that's what pulls the cup in. Okay, A, it's a fire hazard. Uh, B, it doesn't work any better, okay? This goes like this. This just sticks on the tool and hard to do on yourself. Who, who's a volunteer for me? Dr. Ko can be the volunteer just for this point. We'll do more broadly, but just a quick demo on this. So I just create a vacuum, pull the handle a couple of times. You see the skin come up, it's a little dry in here. And then I just twist this off and it stays. And I could go. Okay. And then to release, we just pull on that, pops right off. All right, now this type of cup is not good for the crossover between the gua sha and the cupping. The crossover is when you create a, a suction with the cup and then you move it. Okay, see that's the gua sha. 
right? So this kind is not so suitable. It will work. It's got a nice rounded edge on it, but you do have to have lubrication, but it's not really made for that. However, this type of cup is. So with, again, you still have to have lubrication, but this kind of cup, this is the, the new, newest version, high tech, because all you do is you push down on the top and let go, okay? And then you can move it around. You push down the top, that makes the vacuum. You can see the skin come up. If I'm dry, I'm too dry for it to stick, okay? But once you do that, um, it sticks. And then with your vacuum, you can then drag it around, okay? That's what these are made for, okay? This size is for <laughs> okay, it's for smaller parts. It's for the face. It's actually meant to do that. <laughs> there's even a there's even a baby one. Okay. Now, traditional Toxin involves, um, and also, well, let, let's, before we get to the hammers and the really good stuff, then we have stuff like this. I bought this at Kmart for $9, okay? It is brilliant. It's really well made, and you could go to town with this, okay? It is also meant to be adjustable. All of these slide off. And I can rearrange them. I can put the big ones slightly further out and the narrow ones in the middle. Like if I want to pattern after the spinal cord, for example. Okay? And then it just slips back on. It's all rubber. Okay? And you roll. And you roll. And this tool, assisted energy line release, is about these fingers bringing energy and crunching and breaking up the fascia and connective tissue on whatever has scar tissue and whatever is inhibited. So this type of tool is really good for broad lines. It's good for the IT band. It's good for whatever you can get to. For example, we'll do it in the side line position on the medial leg lines. It's amazing. Okay. Um, this one was, uh, no, actually I think this was 14 at uh, Walmart, this one was nine, okay? And it, actually, there's a traditional version of these tool where these parts here that are spinning freely here are carved out of wood. You can buy it in every Thai market in Thailand, everywhere in Thailand. And so it works really well. See, if I just do this vigorously, Okay, and then you can see the color change and what you can really get on it like this. Brilliant. So if you're working on a mat, you should have some tools right next to your mat. A lot of times the Thai guys, they just have a basket, something like this, just a basket, right? And they have their tools in the basket, you know, and they have this kind of drags around and follows follows their mat around. Okay. Now on the toxin, this is very traditional. This shape. Here's a heavier one. Here's a, a lighter one. Okay. Um, and a mallet or a hammer, um, and it's used. Uh, it has a nice weight, it's not too long, okay? But increasingly, we see ties using this, which is a common rubber mallet available at any hardware store. One of the reasons they like this is, you hear the difference in the sound? Now imagine 20 people doing yeah. that in this room all at the same time, okay? Uh, Oh, isn't that nice? Uh, some ties, they'll actually tie a piece of fabric to their hammer, okay? So that gives it a little more muffled, okay? But lots don't. Notice they come in different shapes. 
this shape is for vertebrae, primarily. Vertebrates in the middle, and this goes on the space on each side. So it's really on the soft tissue. It's not on the vertebrae itself. Again, we don't do toxin on the bone, okay? We do it near, on the ligament, on the attachments, on the, on the muscles that are next to, not directly on the bone, okay? And the different shapes of the different tools um, are basically for the application. If I'm working long and single points, like we're going to do, I don't know, outside line number one, and we know there's five points on outside line number one from the hip to just above the knee, and then I'll get on point number one, point number two, point number three, point number four, point number five, and that's this is the size that's appropriate for that. This is the size that's appropriate for the long like in the shoulder and in the hip and so on. And there are some that are even bigger in diameter. This is really cool. This is used when we scrape along a, a, something really uh, a tendon or connective tissue or I want to work tight to the spine, like right in the lamina groove, for example. And notice I'm, I'm using a no recoil hammer. Okay, again, these are available at Lowe's or any uh, uh, Home Depot uh, type of situation, uh, hardware store, and this hammer is used a lot now in Thai medicine, and the reason why this hammer is used is because it's a recoilless hammer. So, uh, it's, uh, people have been using hammers for a long time, okay? And it's been understood from an occupational disability thing, the swing of a hammer all day causes you to get tennis elbow and have impact related illness, okay? Because when you hit something, that energy is transferred to your arm, okay? So this hammer actually has a medium inside of it that when you hit something with it, it absorbs the impact. So the actual impact that's conveyed to the hand is far less than a conventional hammer would have, maybe half or less, okay? So actually this tool right here is being used a lot by Thai therapists, okay? And of course the rubber hammer has that recoil feature because it's big rubber head, okay? You could use the head, the head by itself. Okay, if you wanted a broad area of contact. So the different shapes of the probes are for smaller, tighter point, points tighter to a bone. I want to work into uh, right up next to the head. I want to get into that point like 736 and get in a direct impact with it like this. It's actually quite amazing the uh, feel. That, and then there's also a nice mount like this. I think I'm gonna take this one and customize it. Uh, maybe some flames and yeah. a logo. Uh, but this is actually a common woodworking tool. So it's um, solid maple, okay? And it is actually made for using, uh, hitting uh, chisels, for example, that have a wooden handle, okay? weight is really nice. It's not heavy, you know, it's light and it conveys that energy really, really well. Okay, so what kind of hammer, you know, you say, oh, you know, I got to have this, this right here was cut, was made from a tree that was struck by lightning in the forest where they collected the wood from the tree that was killed, that was struck by lightning in the woods, an iron tree, and just an iron tree. This is not dyed or tinted. This is actually the color of the wood. And then it was blessed by monks, okay? So it's a lightning created in the tree, blessed by monks, and this is the most traditional type of toxin tool set right here. This is the most traditional. All right, but do you have to have a hammer that was made from a tree, that was struck by lightning, and blessed by a monk? No. No, 
No, you don't. You can go down to your hardware store and you can get a light and nice little hammer for just a couple of dollars. And do you have to have a really, you know, like, like does your tool have to be so finely carved and has the little notches so that your hand won't slip and has this beautiful artistic tie uh, style taper to it and all that kind of thing. Uh, no, it could just be a rounded dowel of any hardwood and you can bless it yourself. You can bless it yourself. Put it on your altar. Bless it yourself. And you can do the work, all right? So far, so good. This is the tool, the pestle, that I use to make the singing bowl work. Can I use this? Absolutely. And lastly, I'll have a look real quick here at, these are stainless steel versions of all of the above. Stainless steel version. So instead of a sword, instead of the knife, the kukri, <laughs> this will break. If I drop this on the hard floor, it'll break. It's a thin piece of jade, and jade even has natural flaws. I've noticed in a few of these that there are some natural flaws in them, and certainly if you tapped it or dropped it or anything, it would just break, okay? This is stainless steel. This is never going to break. This will be here, you know, hundreds of years from now. These tools will still be as useful as 200 years from now as they are today. They can be sterilized in an autoclave. Okay? They can be sterilized. Alright? Again, why the all these concavities and the different shapes, okay, is to conform to the different parts of the body that need the work. Why we have different tools is also just for that purpose. Why would I have this? This is sometimes called the bird, is the name of this shape, okay? Imagine it has the beak, if it had little, its little eyes here, and there's the body where the wings, and there's the tail, you know? Uh, but this is really good for working into the fascia and working into the energy lines on digits and fingers and between toes and behind a tendon. Okay, or a piece of connective tissue. Broader areas, broader tools, more personal preference. Okay, this again, can, any part of it can be used. You know, you would say this is the handle, but it's not necessarily so. Any part can be used, but this one, this is set up like this because we also do the technique on the cranium and it'll move through the hair nice move through the hair but this idea here is good too again broad work on the spine for example and almost always this one of my favorite why because it's the most sword like remember we started with the sword we end with the sword. <laughs> okay? So this again is used on broad areas like, like the back or across the top of the shoulders. Okay? Or down the side of the leg or anywhere where you want to draw and you want to use both hands for pressure. Okay? And you can feel how substantial this is. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. And sometimes you want a heavy tool. 
the, the weight of the tool um, supplements your physical strength and pressure. Part of the reason why swords are heavy, okay, trust me, if it could be lighter, I, I would love it to be lighter. The sword is heavy. I would love it to be lighter. However, the heaviness adds to its efficiency. See, a certain amount of weight gives it carry and throw and penetration, okay? And when properly used, the weight has momentum, which offsets the physical strength to move it once I get it moving. So the trick is knowing how to start, how to get it in motion. And then it has a tendency, right? Object in motion has a tendency to continue its movement, right? So once I get the tool moving, if it has a little weight, uh, that weight carries it a little further and that offsets my effort and energy. So sometimes I like the, the uh, weightier, more substantial tools. They give me a benefit. I don't always use the lightest thing uh, that I can get my hands on. It just depends on what, what is the effect that I'm trying to go for.